Welcome to Gay Guru Live with host Brian Madigan. On Gay Guru Live, Brian will be focusing on everything queer and spiritual. Whether you're looking to come to terms with the faith you were born into or to discover something new, Brian and his guests will light the way with insight and humor. So please welcome your host of Gay Guru Live, Brian Madigan. Hi, everyone. You're watching Gay Guru Live. I'm your host, Brian Madigan, and we're coming to you live on the Bull Brave TV network. Welcome, welcome, welcome to episode 13 of Gay Guru Live, the show that's focusing on everything queer and spiritual. So as we've mentioned and talked about before, one of the things we're trying to accomplish with the show is show queer people regardless of where they may stand on the gender or sexuality spectrum, that there are options for them to engage spiritually. And one of the things that is most challenging for us is the separation between spirituality and religion. We'll be talking a little about that today, and also about discovering this whole idea of the divine, divine feminine, the loss of the divine feminine, and how important that is really for us to reintegrate. So not throwing out spirituality with religion, certainly understandable man, why many of us would want to do that, but integrating a deeper spirituality, presenting a lot of options, and understanding the role that the balance of masculine and feminine energies plays in our lives, particularly <clears throat> as a community where we want to bring all of those qualities together, is super important. And it's one of the things that we all want to learn more about and focus more on. So what exactly does it mean to be queer and spiritual? Today, we'll be talking with Christian de la Huerta. He's a coach, he's a seminar leader, and a breathwork expert, and an author who is going to talk to us about all of these topics and more. So please join me in welcoming Christian to the show. Hey, Brian. Welcome. Hi, Christian. How's it going today? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks for having me on the show. How are you? Oh, it's wonderful to have you here. I'm doing great as well. It's really, really good to have you here. So let's get right into it. Let's talk about, you know, I like to start with talking about childhood, the traditions we were raised in, those kinds of things to give people sort of a, a context in which to sort of understand your journey. So you were raised Catholic in Cuba, correct? Yes, I lived my first 10 years of life in Cuba um, in a communist country which you know for which i'm actually really grateful a lot of a lot of things that we take for granted here in the us um you know both the big things like like due process of the law and um, you know just that kind of of legal protection um, as well as so many freedoms and then little things that we just take for granted here that having lived in a country that didn't offer those you tend to value more right wonderful gives you a good perspective right so messaging, obviously you're growing up in Cuba in a secular, somewhat communist, but still somewhat Catholic country. What was the messaging like for you, uh, you know, as a queer kid growing up? Well, it was interesting that the, in those days there was real danger, like you're, there was real risk that you took in, in going to, to church and practicing religion. Um, but my parents, every, you know, they were really Catholic. I'm one of nine kids, um, all conceived within 12 years. Um, and, you know, they used to dress us all alike and cart us off to church. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 what I value from that is that they really placed whatever their belief was above any risk that they could have taken. And that's why they made such huge sacrifices to make sure that we could come to a country in which you could practice as you believe and not be right. worried about it, not, not be thrown in jail because of it. Right. Pretty powerful conviction towards their faith, which I think probably is something that it has impacted you in terms of your own conviction towards spirituality. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a, a whole other story because you know, I, I knew from a young age that I was that I was gay, even before I knew that there was such a thing. Um, I knew what my feelings were and what okay. what aroused me, what you know, what 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 I was attracted to. Um, and yet, you know, there was this part of me that wanted to serve the sacred as a, the divine, as I understood it then. Um, and yet being told by the religion in which I was raised that there was no room for me, that I was an abomination in the eyes of God and that I was going to burn in hell for eternity. So my adolescence was one long depression um, yeah. as I struggled to, to reconcile those two parts of me. Right. Um, and it, 
I, mean, I, I even went as far as I thought I wanted to be a priest, you know, so and, and I think that part of it was a legitimate wanting to serve humanity and wanting to serve the sacred. Um, and in those days, I, th I naively believed that priests were actually celibate. So I think there was looking right. back on it, I think it was a way that that I did that I could sublimate my sexuality a way that I didn't have to deal with it. I thought. Yeah, I, I think in my pre sort of preteens, I kind of was I was raised Catholic as well, and very similar, very similar kind of journey. Like I and I never really thought about it before, but probably yeah, this idea that I know there's this thing going on for me, and maybe I can hide. But as I'm sure many people fit in the priesthood, right? So yeah, yeah. you're 10 years old, sort of just moving into middle school, very challenging moment in life, and you emigrate to the U.S. So what was that experience like for you? It must have it must have added to that depression and that just feeling of hopelessness as a teenager. Well, I think I think that's when it really the 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 challenging times began because yeah, we came to the US not speaking a word of English and we landed in Milledgeville, Georgia, in the center of Georgia. Um, you know, it was one of one of the few places in the US where the Cuban psychiatrist, my dad was a shrink. Uh, where they could practice as they were going through the process of getting licensed here in the States. Uh, so that's how we ended up there. But as you can imagine, in probably was it what, in the late 60s, early 70s, it wasn't a very welcoming place for foreigners. Like um, so it was kind of, you know, traumatic times for me looking back on that. Um, and, and it was interesting because, you know, like part of human desires to just to fit in to to feel like you belong somewhere so i went through this process the first few of you know first few years that we were there um of denying my hispanic my latino background um and then you know finally like fi when i finally learned english and thankfully at, in the, at that age you learn it pretty fast um because it's not an easy language to learn um but then we moved to Miami, where I went to um, an all boy Jesuit, you know, Catholic school. And now I was, I was completely different all over again, because now I sounded like a Georgia peach. Um, <laughs> not to mention, you know, the, the real difference that the internalize is that I already I was already dealing with those sexual um, orientation questions. Of course, of course, and sort of, and mm. then sort of being dropped back into probably a much more Cuban environment again, right? If you were in Miami. Oh yeah, the school was probably ninety-five percent Cuban American. So like culture shock yeah. again, very yeah, very culture very shock all over again. Being the <laughs> other, being different, standing out, all over again. It's such a powerful part of, I think, the story for all of us, at least at one level or another, and for you coming in a lot of different directions. So in within all of this, um, the decision that no Catholicism wasn't for you, how did that come about for you? Was it a sort of slow progress or was it a, a sort of an awakening moment? It was, no, actually it was, um, you know, it's like, I actually when when I was a senior in high school, I actually went and I met with the head of the novitiate for the Jesuits in that province, the guy who decided who got in and who didn't. Thankfully, he was a wise man who said, well, why don't you do at least a couple of years of college and, and then we'll talk. So I did that. And in those years, several things happened. Three things happened. Um, I, first of all, I took a class in philosophy and existentialism, which began a process of questioning the Catholic worldview, which was the only reality that I knew. Mm -hmm. um, combined with a phase of experimentation with mind expanding substances, which accelerated that process of questioning reality as I understood sure. it. And then I fell in love and I'd had sex and I had sex as a teenager, but it was always from, you know, from a place of secret, it was secretive and dark and filled with shame and fear. Um, but I fell in love this time I fell in love. And I'll never forget, I'll never forget the first kiss, because in that moment, I knew that being gay was not a sickness, and it was not a sin, and it was not evil, and it was not an abomination. And in fact, it was so beautiful uh, that from that moment on, there wasn't a priest or a minister or a psychiatrist or a rabbi or an imam who could tell me otherwise. It's like I knew in my core in my cells that, that it was a beautiful thing and that there was nothing to be ashamed of.
That's that's a great story, and and actually, again, similar similar to mine. It was that first kiss that I was about thirteen when it happened, but it was just that moment where I suddenly realized, this is who I am. This is what the difference has always been, and God's perfectly okay with me. And I just knew somehow in my core, despite all of that messaging, that that wasn't really a truth for me. So you explored some psychedelics. You sort of started to open up. When you moved beyond Catholicism, what did you start to explore from a spiritual perspective? Well, it took a while because, you know, like you were alluding to in the in your opening, we confused, you know, I confused spirituality with religion. I didn't know that there were different things. So like many of us, I threw the baby out with the baptismal water. I wanted nothing to do with spirituality, with religion. I wanted nothing to do with a, with a deity, if there was such a thing, to who, who would have created me as gay and then made it wrong. Um, right. made it something sinful, maybe something to be exiled from the rest of humanity because of. Um, so most of my 20s, I wanted nothing to do with, with that. So I developed, you know, I spent my 20s, I was happy, I was, I was in a couple of relationships, I was developing professionally, personally. And as I began to approach, you know, the dreaded 3-0, <laughs> I began to question I began to question myself, right? You know, it's because it seemed the more that I had and the more that I was, you know, I had a pretty nice cushy job and I was sought after socially and professionally, but it seemed to me that the more I had, there was like an expanding hole in my gut. Like I kept thinking there has to be more life than all this. Right. And so towards the end of my, as I was approaching that, that pivotal time in most of our lives, I began to search again. I began to, to look for, for meaning. And so at this time I looked towards the East. So I started learning about meditation and breath work. And, um, Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. All right, it's time for us to take a quick break. Uh, you've been watching Gay Guru Live. I'm your host, Brian Madigan, coming to you live on the Bull Brave TV network with our guest, Christian De La Huerta. When we're back, we're going to talk about that discovery of Eastern philosophy, breath work particularly, which is such an important part of the work that Christian does with people today. So hang tight. We'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy easysense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back, everyone. You're watching Gay Guru Live. I'm your host, Brian Madigan, coming to you live on the Bull Brave TV network with our guest, Christian De La Huerta, talking about his eventual 
desertion of Catholic Catholicism and finally finding spirit somewhere else. So let's talk about Eastern philosophy and breathwork. I know they're both important parts of the work that you do today. Yeah, well, that's what, what I mostly learned from that initially was that there was a different way um, to approach spirituality and, and that it had nothing to do with a punitive, micromanaging, busybody deities, you know, sending, you know, punishing people for, for who they were. Um, and, and so I started learning meditation. I started learning about understanding the ego mind and, and how it keeps us in a, in a prison um, of fear and lack and limitation and judgment and evaluate and, and um, reactivity. Um, and so it was really shifting, but what really shifted the experience for me was breathwork, which, you know, there's, we don't really have time to dive into what breathwork is because it's a very broad umbrella term that includes okay. a, a lot of different breathing practices. But the one that I'm talking about, you do for about an hour, an hour and a half, and you breathe in a powerful, uh, connected, circular way, and amazing stuff happens. Like, I don't know anything that heals as, as quickly and as multi and, and as, as many levels as this does. In, in fact, you know, my dad, was, as I said, was a psychiatrist. My, my degrees in psychology, I was on a track to, to get a PhD until I tried breathwork. And then I, after one session, I jumped tracks. I never went for the PhD because it works so fast and heals so profoundly in so many ways. I don't know anything to date that, that heals as quickly as it does. And, and I know it sounds too good to be true, that just from breathing, all this stuff can happen because on top of the healing at many levels, including physically, by the way, uh, you can have some of the most amazing spiritual experiences that I've had and many, many people have had. Um, yeah. And, you know, they haven't studied breathwork in the same way that they've studied meditation. So much research on what's happening in the brain when we meditate and all the benefits of that. They're just now beginning to research breath, breathwork. But if, if we think about the fact that in most spiritual traditions and even some secular languages, the same word, one word, can mean breath or it can mean spirit. And so there's that breath spirit connection, which I think it ultimately is, is what helps me understand how it can work so powerfully. Right. Yeah, I agree completely. And we'll cycle back and talk a little bit more about breath work later, because I know it's an important part of the work that you do do with people. So I want to talk a little bit about awakening the soul of power, this whole idea of the soul of power and the word power. So let's just quickly define what soulful power is to sort of get us started. Well, I think I need to zoom out a little bit more and, and sure. presage it by saying that most of us have an ambivalent and I would even say conflicted relationship with power. Absolutely. Like part of us wants it, part of us is afraid of it. And I think what we fear is that if we really stepped into our power, if we really stepped into all of who we are, that other people wouldn't be able to handle it and that we might end up alone, rejected and you know, who wants that? I think we also fear that we might abuse it and no wonder like how many abuses of power have we witnessed um, in our lives and and i think we will add to that that we've been conditioned to believe that power is a bad thing with quotes like power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely but what they didn't tell us about that quote is that lord acton who spoke them uh, who spoke those words was speaking specifically about political power, not personal power, which is what you and I are talking about. Right. So when you add to that mix, the fact that we've also been conditioned to think that the emotions are bad, that the emotions are weakness, especially as guys, especially as men, you know, like we little boys don't cry because, because, you know, we can get into the whole other conversation about, the the meaning of the the, the balancing the, the masculine and the, and the feminine mm -hmm. but we've we've turned the feminine into something weak um mm -hmm. and there's so many faulty assumptions about all that but what happens when we when we put all that into a mix is that we end up giving our power away we end up settling for less we end up saying yes when inside we really feel no we end up overriding our true feelings, our desires, our dreams, our preferences, and settling for an illusion of security for morsels of pseudo love. 
and, and for a false sense of acceptance. And so not a good strategy mm-hmm. um, by any stretch of the imagination. So what this book is about is, is, is how do we step into power in a different way? How do we step into power in a way that doesn't require that we push anybody down, step on them, put our knee to their neck in order for us to feel powerful? How do we do it in a way that has nothing to do with hierarchy, control, fear, force, domination, manipulation? And so one of the, one of the first steps on that journey of reclaiming our power is understanding that they're different types. And so I talk about worldly power or ego power, egoic power in contrast with spiritual power or soulful power. So think about, you know, we tend to associate power, the way that the world relates to power is people who, who have fame, who are, you know, have money, who are rich, who are high up in some kind of hierarchy, whether it's a corporate ladder or any kind of organization or, or institution. But to think about all those kinds of powers that they're external, they're outside of us. So fickle, you know, here today, gone tomorrow Mm -hmm. that kind of worldly power always has an agenda too it's always trying to grab something to get something for itself and it's always self-aggrandizing right so blowing itself up to seem bigger than it is we don't have to go very far back in history uh to to see great examples of of that (laughs) not at all um and 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 but the thing is that as exemplified um by he who should not be named um that power is is it's just illusory it's it's there's nothing behind it like you you know you face up to a bully and the bully backs backs off kind of thing so so contrast that with what i call spiritual power or soulful power that's inside each and every one of us and nobody can give it to us and nobody can take it away we are the only ones who give it away um and it's got nothing to prove like it just is so think of of a gandhi or or a gandalf you know if you're into the lord of the rings in their simple monastic robes their, their sandal feet from looking at them you would never know how much power they hold except when it's needed and then get out of the way gandhi brought the british empire to its knees when it was at its highest point in terms of global reach and influence without ever shooting a single gun or landing a single punch. That's power. Yeah, amazing power. So obviously in order to even move in that direction, we need to, the first thing we clearly need to do is heal our relationship to power. So how, how do you see people going about doing that or starting to do that? Well, I've, I mean, I've been working on, on that for probably 10, 12 years in, in retreats. And so, yeah, it works. For, and for the first part, as you were talking about before, is understanding, like in understanding our relationship to power and why we believe the things we do, right? So for example, like I work with a lot of women too, um, and they have a lot of them have the subconscious belief that if they really stepped into their power, that no man would ever wanna be with them. And sure, that's true for a lot of guys, but mm-hmm. really all you need is one who is not threatened by by your power, uh, by your being in your power, who actually relishes, you know, being in real partnership with an equal partner um, and who Something celebrates. Being with. <laughs> Someone's exactly. actually worth being with. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so understanding that, that, and then like understanding our beliefs about power and starting to deconstruct why we believe the things we do. And then understand the patterns around power, the behavior patterns, the relationship patterns. Like, do I tend to give my power away in in romantic, intimate, sexual relationships? Or maybe it's with authority figures, you know, parental figures, bosses, religious leaders, coaches, that type of thing. So it's beginning to understand who we are, what we believe, and why we do the things we do. And, and the only way around the, uh, to, to get to that place is to go within because nobody, nobody's going to answer that for us except right. ourselves. Of course. So in terms of that and in terms of doing that inner work, obviously the ego in terms of the classical Eastern sense of ego is going to be an issue for us, right? Because that spiritual power, the ego is always going to want to try to grab onto that spiritual power and turn it into sort of more earth-based, sort of more physical or political power. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
um, and, and so that's that's like a primary part of the process is, is understanding what the ego is. And you know, we don't have time to get into it here. But yeah. here's a great video. Here's a great simple way to think about it. If you put a baseball in the center of a stadium, that's what the ego is. It's you know the ego in Latin means I, that sense of I-ness, that sense of separate identity. This is Christian, that's Brian sitting over there. Ultimately, it's an illusion, both a helpful illusion and the source of all our suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's so really important to understand what that ego construct is. Um, because because that's what has impacted and gotten in the way of of all of our relationships right and and then you, yeah because that the, as you were talking about that part of us will turn spiritual teachings and use them as weapons so you know it's called a you know the, the spiritualized ego you know that it still has you know it's running it's 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 shenanigans and it's control freak and it's projections and it's judgments and it's demands and it's um, expectations of everyone and everything. Um, but d does it now with under the semblance of, you know, love and light? Um, well, whatever, the, you know, and ends up creating theocracy. Never, never the best idea for any of us. Oh, no, no. So how do you think specifically it's important for queer people to reclaim this understanding of spiritual power and the power that we really do have as individuals, regardless of sort of what's going on around us? Well, you know, that's, that's what I wrote about in my first book, Coming Out Spiritually, which is basically saying that it's really sad. It's really tragic that so many people in our community, in the LGBTQ community, struggle with spirituality because like you and i know we confused it with religion and no wonder given given the treatment that we have received in, at the hands of most religions and still do by many but the ironic part of it the sad part the tragic part is that before the patriarchal cultures and religions people that we today call lgbtq were not only spiritually inclined but were actually honored and respected and revered for the spiritual roles of service and leadership that we played all over this planet, across every culture. Um, and so what, the, what I did in that book is name 10 spiritual roles or archetypes that we used to, that we have always played throughout history, like mediators or scouts of consciousness or keepers of beauty um, that to me are you know, spiritual functions um, that, that brings so much value to this, to this world so that we can begin to reclaim our innate spiritual nature. You know, it's, it's just as ludicrous to reject our spirituality as it is to try and reject our sexuality, which many of us try to do as well. You know, they're both parts, inherent parts of our humanity. And, and so, part of this process of spiritual growth and transformation and evolution is integration, integrating all these parts of our rejected humanity. And the word to integrate comes from integer, which means whole number, um, it's, you know, same root as, as integrity. So, so we want to reclaim and find ways of expressing that are a match for who we are so that we can become whole again. Right. So would you would you say that the, the essence of soulful power really is the person being able to be that integrated whole person, bringing as many of those disowned parts as possible together? So there's like a single functioning, awakened person, really, if we want to use sort of a more Eastern term. I, you know, I love I love that I hadn't phrased that in just that way, but I think it totally applies. Um, Beautiful. I think okay. I think that is where where soulful power resides is soulful power is our authentic power. Right. So it resides in our authentic selves, whatever that may be. Whatever that may be. Beautiful. So it's time for us to take another quick break. You're watching Gay Guru Live, coming to you live on the Bull Brave TV network with our special guest, Christian De La Huerta. When we're back, we're going to be talking about his personal practice with breath work and his clients and how we can start to reintegrate the divine feminine into our lives and why that's so important. So hang tight and we'll be right back. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality? 
but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating. Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like... I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Welcome back, everyone. You're watching Gay Guru Live. I'm your host, Brian Madigan, coming to you live on the Bull Brave TV Network with our special guest, Christian De La Huerta. So Christian, in Awakening the Soul of Power, you talk a lot about reclaiming, re-understanding the divine feminine and how that helps us move into a redefinition of masculinity and the masculine that will be healthier and better for all of us in the world. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, you know, the book is for everybody. Everybody struggles with, with power, but it has a particular message for women's empowerment. And that comes from my belief that the empowerment of women is the single most important thing that needs to happen in the world. And it's not to idealize women. It's not to put women up on a pedestal. Women also abuse power. Um, but it's because as a world, as a species, we've been running so off kilter, so off balance between the masculine and the feminine energies that course through all of us because they course through all creation. And, and much to the surprise of, of some humans, we are part of creation. We are part of the cosmos. So we're, we're governed by the same principles that govern the stars. Um, and, and so I believe that when women are in 50% of power in this planet, in this world, we're going to have a very different relationship to war and poverty and hunger and how we treat the environment, to education, social justice, to all of it. And by the way, homophobia. And misogyny, two, two, two sides of the same coin. Absolutely. In fact, such an important message for our community. They are the same thing. Same thing. If you look at all the religions, all the cultures that persecute and make wrong homosexuality, 100% correlation, they're the ones where women are less than equal. Um, and we can get into that whole discussion, um, you know, but, 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 you know, let's look at one, let's look at, at a simple one, which is one of the six holy texts of terror, you know, one of the, the biblical passages that are yep. interpreted and mistranslated to oppress and to condemn homosexuality. It was the one that says, I think it's Romans, I forget the, the verse and, and number, but it's the one that says that, you know, you shouldn't lie with a, with a man in the same way that you do with a woman. They don't say anything about two women. Why is that? Right? Well, first of all, women weren't even human, you know, 2000 right. years ago, women, women were property. Mm -hmm. And, but if you so who cared, you know, what two women did. Um, but, but let's flash forward to today, where even, you know, homophobic men, because that's probably probably where, where it's found the most. Um, Two, you know, you talk about two women together is like, ooh, ooh, you know, I want some of that. I want to get into that. Yeah. Two men together, like shoot them or or you or or the yuck syndrome. So yeah. what is that? And and to me, you know, more that I think about that is is that 
in their mind, two women together doesn't rock the status quo because they don't have equal power in their mind. But two men together, one of them in their mind is willingly giving up the superior male status. And that's a threat to the status quo. Right. And, and I think that's, that's why that's, that's where some of those roots are. Right. So this reclaiming of the divine feminine is, is obviously important for all of us as a species. I, and, and I think it's particularly important in, for queer men. Uh, because if there's any culture that's suffering from toxic max masculinity, it's ours. So what do you think about that idea? Well, let's, let's look at, you know, the, the misunderstanding, you know, the mislabeling of the feminine as weakness, because that's where it stems from. And that's where that conditioning originates, right? Since we were kids, we were told little boys don't cry. So why is that? Because only little girls cry. Well, what does that mean? Like, like only little, only little girls are weakness. I mean, so so these are where those faulty assumptions come in. First of all, that the emotions are weakness. It's like, wait a minute, the emotions aren't strength. They're not weakness. They're not good. They're not bad. They're just like everything else in creation. They're energies. How we express them, depending on how we express our emotions, they have a good or a not so good effect. So that's one assumption. The other assumption is that the feminine is weakness. It's like, wait a minute. You want to talk strength, courage, resilience, ability to, to withstand pain. Let's talk about the, 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 the courage and, and, and the, ability, the, the creation, the power of creation that resides in the female body. And, you know, like, here's a story that it's, I don't know if it's true or not, but it, the way that I was told to me was, it was, it's about Betty White, you know, we lost about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And so apparently she was being interviewed in, in one of those group celebrity interviews. And somebody said something about having balls. And she goes, wait a minute, where do we get this assumption, this connection between balls and courage and strength? You thump those little things and the guy collapses, bends over in pain. <laughs> you want to talk courage? You want to talk strength? Let's talk vaginas. Those things take a pounding. <laughs> in both directions. Yeah, it's, it, it's true. Women's, women's bodies go through so much more than ours do. And they're so much stronger, really, in so many ways. And you're right. Yeah, it's a beautiful perspective on it. Yeah, so once, once we begin, you know, it's, it's, it's a joke, but there's a lot of truth behind it. And it's not that we want to go back to a matriarchal society. We don't want that. We want balance. That's what we need. And if we want that to be in the world, we, if we, want, we want to find that balance in the world. It's got to start within, within each one of us. So where are we making the feminine wrong in ourselves? Where are we swallowing our emotions? Where are we walking around like these uncaring, unfeeling robots? thinking that that's strength is wait a minute that's not strength like walking around like this like robots it's prison it's like yeah and you know it's like it's it's one of the things that i get to in that chapter that you were referencing about what it means to be a man because i added i thought you know it's a lot of messaging about empowering women but we can't leave men behind either mm. um because that's sort of the rear guard right now you know women are bursting free and stepping into their power uh, and it's mostly heterosexual men that are like, oh, whoa, 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 this is changing too fast. Let's go back to the way it used to be in the 50s. Um, but, you know, this patriarchal system, like this power over system, this hierarchical my way or the highway, this cowboy men mentality doesn't work for anybody, including men. Like, and so without minimizing what women have, have withstood over the last few year, thousand years of patriarchy, men have also paid a price so let's look at some numbers and if you look at mortality around the world in the u.s women outlive men by five years globally by seven years and the suicide numbers i only have for the u.s but in the u.s men commit suicide four times as frequently as women in yeah. fact i think it's 75 percent of 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 the suicides in this country are committed by middle-aged white men, which is really interesting because that's the group that still holds the majority of the power in this world disproportionately. And 
you would think, well, wait a minute, what if, what if, you know, the most powerful group in the world, they, they should have it the best, they should have the most benefits, they should have the, the they should have be the, the healthiest. Privilege. We'd assume they'd be the happiest, right? Live the longest. But, you know, I think that's part of the problem is that we have this mistaken, limited, limiting perspective of what it means to be a man. And so we walk around with these misunderstandings about manhood and masculinity. And, and we're, again, for letting go of whole parts of being human, like denying our emotions. That's just part of being human. And, and there's a price to pay for that. And so, you know, it's like, and which connects to the breath work because um, part of the way that breath work does is it clears all these emotional blocks that we have, um, you know, like after a lifetime of suppressing emotions, what used to be spiritual teaching that everything is energy. Now we know from quantum physics that it's all energy. This chair that I'm sitting on, the computer that, that I'm looking into, the mic, the body, the emotions, even though it might, even though, it, it might feel solid, it's just energy, it's just vibration. And we know from physics, energy cannot be destroyed. So all those times throughout our lives where we have swallowed our emotions because we didn't wanna rock the boat, because, we were, because of all that conditioning that we were talking about, because we didn't feel safe expressing how we felt. That stuff doesn't go away. It gets stuck in the tissues of the body. And after a lifetime, of doing that, we walk around with layers and layers and more layers of repressed emotional crap. And then here we are trying to have a relationship in the present moment, all of it getting filtered through that lifetime of unhealed past trauma and repressed emotions. Right. Yikes. And that's a really beautiful sort of way to segue back to breath work. I know that you do a lot of breath work with your clients. I'd like just to talk a little bit about sort of the way that works, because I agree with you in every tradition, every tradition that I've looked at, all the earth based traditions, certainly breath, breath is life. Breath is everything. And in, it's interesting in Hawaiian, the word haole, which we usually just assume means white people. One of the possible translations is the people who can't breathe. So the Hawaiians see us breathing from the top quarter of our lungs and go, whoa, these people can't breathe. No wonder, no wonder, right? So that idea no of wonder. breath is liberating as bringing us into ourselves and letting us see things that were invisible before. I'd love to touch on that a little bit. Yeah, in, in Hawaiian, ha means breath. Means breath. And so when you know when you, when you see, in, we used to see like whether, you know, Alaskan Inuits or Hawaiians, you know, greeting each other by putting forehead against forehead, what they were actually doing was exchanging breath. Like I would exhale and then you would breathe my inhale and then vice versa. Um, so it's, it was a really profound act. And that's why they called the Howleys, which is a pretty, you know, negative term in, in Hawaii. It's, you know, that it means no breath. Mm -hmm. And, and we find that connection between breath and spirit in, in many different traditions and in many secular languages. Um, and, and so if you think about it, one example, pneuma, you know, in ancient Greek meant sung, for, you know, from that word we get pneumonia. In Greek, it means su uh, lung and soul. Uh, from, and from the Latin spirare, from that root, we get both respiration and inspiration or expiration. So it's that connection is, is, is everywhere. So what happens when we do breath work, when we fill ourselves with that, like a really powerful way, not just going through, you know, the way we normally breathe, but with intentional breathing, conscious breathing, it goes into the tissues of the body and it clears those emotional blockages. And, you know, people, it's a really powerful practice. People recover memories, people um, like one session can change your life. Um, that's why I jumped tracks and never went for the PhD with all due respect to the psychotherapy program, it's to psychotherapy. Um, you know, in the right hands with clear goals, it can be very supportive. And we all know that you can sit on somebody's couch for 5, 10, 20, 30 years, rehashing the same old crap, and nothing happens. And the right. reason for that is that that trauma no longer lives in the mind. It's been somaticized. It now lives in the, in the cells of the body. So no amount of talking about it is going to get to it. Like you can talk about what happened to you, turn blue in the face, and the, the symptoms, the behaviors, the, the misunderstandings, the, the choices that were made, the, the learned behavior patterns as a result of those past traumas are still going to be in place. Uh, so the beauty about the practice like breath work is that it bypasses the mind and it goes to the source of where the trauma now is and it clears those traumas. 
and and very powerful, very uh, quick effect. Yeah, and life changing. I am certainly has been for me in the different schools of breathwork that I've studied and worked with. So yeah, very powerful. So it's time for us to take another quick break. You're watching Gay Guru Live, coming to you live on the Bold Brave TV network with our special guest Christian de la Huerta. When we're back, we're going to be talking about an exciting uh, conference that Christian has coming up in the in June, and all the details about how you can get hold of him and his books. So hang tight, and we'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back, everybody. You're watching Gay Guru Live, coming to you live on the Bull Brave TV Network with our special guest, Christian De La Huerta. Christian. You have a virtual conference coming 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 up in June. Tell us all about it. Well, it's exactly what we were talking about before. It's, it's to help our community, the LGBTQ community, reclaim our spiritual heritage. So it's going to be over a week. We're going to have you know 25, 30 speakers from different traditions representing all the all those letters of the alphabet. Um, you know, making it as as inclusive as possible, um, and It'll be free, a free conference, and all they have to do is, you know, get, get on my email list. Um, so probably the best way to do that is go to my website, which is soulfulpower.com, S-O-U-L-F-U-L, power, P-O-W-E-R.com. And uh, anybody who gets on my email list, will will send them a, um, a copy of uh, some of the power practices from this latest book. We'll send them a sample chapter from the book. And, and we'll send them a guided meditation that I created um, in the midst of the pandemic, just to how do we find a place of trust and a place of center in the middle of, of chaos? Yeah, um, yeah, beautiful. So yeah, really exciting. I that it, that sounds like an absolutely wonderful thing. I I will certainly be attending <laughs> now that I know about it. Yeah. Um, so you've already given us your website. We know how to get hold of you there. Um, contact information is there for anybody who's looking for it. Let's talk a little bit about the books and how you get hold of them. I know there's two books out there and more books coming. So talk about your life as an author. Yeah, <laughs> you know, thank you for asking that. It, of all the things that I do, that's what I resist the most is is writing. And and, and I know I'm a good writer, um, but it's for you know some people love it, some people get lost in that. That's not the case for me. For me, it's work, um, and it's part of what you know. It's part of my job description. Part of what I have to do to get my message out there. Um, and so the books are available wherever books are sold. You know, can you, you can have it ordered at your local bookstore if you want to support them. Uh, or you can get it on Amazon or any of those book selling um, websites online. Beautiful. 
So there's also a Facebook group called Unleash Your Inner Hero. Talk a little bit about what that's about, why it's there, and how people can join. Well, this, the, and, the, and the book is, this latest book, Awakening the Soul of Power, is part of a series of three. The, the next one that I'm about halfway done uh, with, it's on relationships, how to do relationships consciously, which is one of the themes that I, that I you know, that I take on retreats. In fact, the next retreat I have coming up in, in the Bay Area is the end of March, and it has to do on unconscious relationships. Um, so what does it mean to be a hero? and to live heroically in the 21st century. You know, most of it, that's another word that we struggle with, that we have a hard time owning because we tend to associate heroism with first responders, warriors, you know, people who, who, who actually place their lives at risk for the sake of someone else or for the, for the sake of a larger cause. I think the pandemic has, has helped us expand that definition so that we now include our healthcare practitioners, our doctors, our nurses, our, our respiratory therapists, I would even include our delivery people and grocery store clerks who really Absolutely. made some sacrifices in their own personal lives in order to yeah. keep us fed and provided for, uh, to keep society going. But what about the rest of us? So that's what the, the book is about. That's what this, this chapter is about. You know, what is, you know, like, like to go through life just at the, you know, at the, at the effect of other people's expectations of societal conditioning, anybody can do that. To be willing to ask the hard questions, to look at ourselves, to dive deep within, deep within, to um, face our, our fears, our, our shadow, our inner demons, that's heroic. It takes work, it takes courage to be able to do that. You know, reacting and splattering somebody over the wall, you know, on the wall whenever they did something that hurt us or that we interpreted as, as hurtful, um, anybody can do that. To feel that ouch and to take a deep breath and to bring choice back into the equation, like, all right, how do I want to show up in this case so that I get off this merry-go-round of they do this, I do that, eh, 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 that boring thing that we've done a thousand times. That's heroic to choose and not react as heroic. And so those are just a couple of the ways in which um, we all have access, right? We all have a, an inner hero. So the book, the Facebook, the Facebook group, my retreats are all about helping us unleash that and, and step into our own power, step into our own um, purpose, you know, what we're really here to do. Beautiful. So, do you have a closing message or closing remarks that you'd like to share with our audience? Well, I would say for everybody that, that there is a way that we can reclaim our power and step into our power that is a match for who we are, right? That, that doesn't, like I said before, doesn't require that we push anybody down or step on them or abuse it or be corrupted by it. Those are just misunderstandings around power. Um, and for our LGBTQ sisters and brothers, uh, um, you know, that it's important that we find a way to, ex to connect with our innate spiritual nature. Um, it's just, again, part of who we are, just like our sexuality is. And, and to find ways of expressing that um, in a way that is a match for us, um, again. And, and that's where we're going to find our, our sense of purpose. Beautiful. Christian, yeah. thank you. Anybody you listening to this who stayed through the whole thing? No, I, I was just going to say that anybody who's who's still with us knows that there isn't anybody out there who's who know who's going to make us happy. And how unfair to put that expectation on somebody else. You are going to make me happy. Yikes! So the only thing that's going to make us happy is is discovering who we are and giving expression to that fully in the world. Beautiful. Christian, thank you so much for being with us today. It was a great conversation. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot out of it. And uh, hopefully we've helped you fill that June virtual conference. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Brian. I really appreciate you and the conversation. And I'm so grateful that you reach many, many, many lives. Great. Thank you so much.
So breath is life. I think we got that point across fairly clearly today. Also this idea of reclaiming the divine feminine in almost every earth-based tradition. The belief is that our higher self, our most evolved self, is equally balanced masculine and feminine energy than that anything else is illusion. So it really is becoming our whole selves, is reclaiming this divine feminine in a patriarchal culture that is over accentuated. Frankly, a lot of the negative qualities of masculinity and has caused problems. So you've been watching Gay Guru Live. If if you like this episode, please do me a favor and click like on whatever you're watching or listening to this on. If you know somebody who would benefit from the information we share today, please go ahead and share the link with them. It would mean the world to us to expand our audience and expand the impact that we can have showing queer people that there are paths forward into spirituality that can match just about anybody's desires and needs. So again, you've been watching Gay Guru Live, coming to you live on the Bull Brave TV network. I'm your host, Brian Madigan, signing off for now, and we'll see you all next week. You've been watching Gay Guru Live with your host, Brian Madigan. As queer people, many of us have been rejected, even traumatized, but there are new ways forward that will allow you to discover the path that's right for you. Right here, Wednesdays, 4 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave TV network.